All right, the importance of safety. NIOSH calculates that approximately 100 deaths and 20,000 injuries occur annually in the U.S. due to forklifts. The costs incurred by forklift-related accidents are estimated to be over $100 million. 20% of forklift incidents involve a forklift striking a pedestrian. Something to think about while driving, without a doubt. You guys are all, how many of you guys have been around forklifts all, all, around, all along with your career? So, okay. So, I won't even break down a lot of stuff. Um, the few things that I'll break down, like in our, uh, your electric batteries and stuff like that, different uh, things, to safety things to look out there. You, here in this shop, all of us, it will play a huge factor for. So I'll, I'll get into a lot of that. Um, how to use these chargers. The biggest thing I'm finding out there is I'm going out to all these customers that we have and the, they don't have a clue how to use their chargers, their batteries. They don't know how to maintenance them. They have no safety orientation of any kind. So. It's a huge deal with this group right here for us, so we'll take that as an opportunity today. <coughs> um, powered industrial truck is any vehicle such as lift truck, fork truck, motorized hand truck, or any other specialized industrial truck that is powered by electric motors or internal combustion engines. OSHA requires all potential forklift operators to attend forklift training before operating equipment. The training must cover, I'm sorry, I'm sitting here thinking about the test as I do this. I don't have my folder, the test forms, and then this here. Everybody needs to sign this real quick for me, please. And then just pass that around. That way, if I can get that to her ahead of time, you can have your certifications made up by the time we're done. <clears throat> okay. Um, this training must cover truck-related topics, workplace-related topics, the requirements of the 29 CFR 1910.178 standard. Um, workplace-related topics, there's quite a few, um, that Lamborghini being one of them, you know, um, oil spills I like to address, battery acids, stuff like that. We can talk about it through here, as well as when we go out and do an inspection, just throw out a few examples. Um, truck related topics, just that'll all pretty much be um, on the inspection as we go through it. Okay, uh, training truck related topics include but are not limited to operating instructions, warnings, and precautions, differences between the truck and the automobile, truck controls and instrumentation, engine or motor operation, operating limitations. Vehicle capacity and stability, vehicle inspections and maintenance, refueling or recharging of batteries, steering and maneuverability, visibility, including restrictions, fork and attachment adaptation, operation, and use limitations. If anybody has any questions at all about any of this stuff as we go through, if you don't understand what they're trying to point out, just ask. For me, safety is the biggest one out there. And uh, to whatever you know, whatever extents we have to, to get answers for you guys. Um, again, work, work, workplace related topics include, but are not limited to, surface conditions, composition of loads being carried, load manipulation, stacking and unstacking, pedestrian traffic in areas to be operated, hazardous locations, ramps and other slope surfaces, closed environments and other areas of insufficient ventilation, lots of factors there, uh, other unique or potentially hazardous environmental conditions in the workplace, narrow aisle or other restricted areas. Uh, each class of forklift is specific to areas uh, dedicated to them, narrow aisle particularly. Uh, refresher training must be provided when the operator has been observed to operate the vehicle in an unsafe manner, the operator has been involved in an accident or a near miss incident. The operator is assigned to drive a different truck or a condition in the workplace changes in a manner that could affect safe operation of the truck. And let's see. Okay, um, I'm going to stop right there real quick before we get carried away with all the different classifications of the truck. Um, I'd like to show a video right here.
Did you know that operating a forklift is a specialized job that requires training and authorization by your employer to become a qualified operator? This training video is an introduction to the procedures and safety protocols all employees need to know in the operation of any form of powered industrial truck, or more commonly known as forklifts. This program will cover all required OSHA training material, including the contents of the OSHA standard, types and characteristics of forklifts, pre-operational inspections, basic driving, stability, and load handling, fuels and batteries, and attachments. OSHA estimates that tens of thousands of employees are injured or killed due to forklift accidents, injuries, and deaths. To reduce the number of powered industrial truck accidents, OSHA revised and updated its regulation 29 CFR 1910.178. OSHA defines powered industrial trucks as any specialized industrial truck powered by electric motors or internal combustion engines. This revised OSHA regulation requires initial forklift operator training before any employee can be allowed to operate such equipment. In addition, an employee must go through retraining in case of involvement in an accident or a near miss. The operator is observed driving in an unsafe manner, the operating conditions or the equipment changes, and every three years. In addition to your classroom training on powered industrial trucks, hands-on driving training and a driving evaluation should follow. The OSHA regulations are to be made available to all employees. Contact your training instructor or your supervisor to review copies of them. There are many different types and styles of forklift. It is important that you understand the trucks your employer utilizes. Familiarize yourself with and reference the operator's manual that comes with the truck you will be using. Powered industrial trucks are divided into seven classes based on their basic functions and characteristics. Class 1, Electric Counterbalanced Trucks. It has no exhaust and is often used indoors. Class 2, narrow aisle lift trucks and order pickers. If the operator is raised, they must use fall protection. Class three, electric powered hand trucks or pallet jacks. This only includes powered pallet jacks, including both the walked behind jack and the ridden jack. Class four, solid rubber tired combustion fueled counterbalanced forklifts. These are only to be used on smooth surfaces, usually asphalt or concrete. Class 5, Pneumatic Tired Combustion Fueled Counterbalanced Forklifts. These can be used on unpaved surfaces, but not rough terrain. Class 6, Tow Vehicles, such as the ones used at airports to tow planes and luggage carts. These do not lift loads. Class 7, Counterbalanced Rough Terrain Forklifts. These are commonly used on construction sites. These seven classes of powered industrial trucks were established based on their different handling and safety characteristics. It is important that you understand the specific type of vehicle you will be operating. You will only be able to operate the classification of truck that you've been trained on. All trucks have hazardous location designations. These designations inform operators if the truck may be used in various flammable, combustible, or hazardous areas. These areas should be properly marked, and any vehicle not meeting the proper safety qualifications should not be operated in these areas. Consult the OSHA Standard 1910.178 Table N1 for more information concerning designated areas. Before the start of each shift, equipment inspection should be done. If anything is found to be defective, the vehicle should be taken out of service. You should also notify your supervisor of the problem. 
To assist with your inspection of the equipment, an inspection checklist form should be used and is usually provided by your employer. These checklists may also be obtained in the operator's manual or by the equipment manufacturer. A sample checklist has also been provided with this training program. The inspections checklist includes all safety items that need to be in working order. They include lights, horn, brakes, backup alarms, and seat belts. Other items to include in your inspection checklist are any moving parts, load supporting parts such as the mast, chains, and carriage, fluid levels, tires, steering, overhead guard, backrest, and any other items recommended by the manufacturer of the equipment. When conducting your equipment inspection, the first items to check are those that can be done without the engine running. If all these items check out properly, then move on to the items to be checked with the engine running. Put the forklift through its normal maneuvers and check all its functions. Be especially cautious not to place your hands in areas of moving parts or between the uprights of the mast. Seat belts must be worn on all powered industrial trucks. If your forklift is not equipped with one, contact the manufacturer to obtain one. While operating any powered industrial truck, it is important to keep all body parts inside the operator's area at all times. You must operate the vehicle in designated and safe areas only. Make sure that the driving surface is clean and free of debris or spills. You need to pay close attention and be alert of any obstructions in the aisles you are operating on or of low-hanging items that you may damage. You also need to be observant for lights, sprinkler heads, pipes, or other overhead items. Always maintain a safe speed. Forklifts should never be driven faster than would allow for a safe stopping distance. The maximum safe speed should be equivalent to a fast-paced walk. You should also gauge a safe operating speed based on driving conditions, pedestrians, and loads. When following behind another forklift, maintain a distance of three truck lengths. When coming to an intersection or a doorway, you should always slow down and alert others of your approach by sounding your horn. Most powered industrial trucks are designed to be operated by one-person drivers. Do not give rides to others. Do not allow any person to stand or pass underneath a raised load. Do not drive up to anyone standing in front of a fixed object. Always be alert of pedestrians near you and give them the right of way. Be sure to always look in all directions before you begin to operate your vehicle. Some forklifts have rear wheel steering that is different in operating than front wheel steering. Trucks tend to swing wide and you must compensate for this. When crossing curbs or railroad tracks, do so at an angle. This helps keep at least two wheels in contact with the ground to prevent tipping. Each forklift and detachment will have a permanent nameplate that states its rated capacity. These nameplates should be easily readable and the rated capacity should never be exceeded. A forklift's rated capacity is based on the fulcrum principle. Like a seesaw, the front wheels are the base of the fulcrum. If the load is too heavy or too far from the fulcrum, the forklift will tip forward. The stability of each forklift is determined by ever-changing factors based on the stability triangle of the forklift. The front axle acts as the base of the triangle and supports the weight of the load. The sides of the stability triangle meet at the point where the forklift steers, either at a single wheel or in the middle of the steering axle on the four-wheeled models. The center of gravity for the forklift is changed by the load and by momentum. 
The forklift will tip over if either of these factors force the center of gravity outside the stability triangle. Each load has its own load center. This is the center of its weight mass. This distance greatly affects the load capacity of forklifts. The nameplate will state the load center measurement in which the capacity is based. In most cases, this is 24. This means that the load center should be no further than 24 inches away from the mast of the forklift. If the load center is further away, then the load capacity will diminish. Tilting the mast forward also changes the stability triangle. The mast should never be tilted forward when raised unless it is over a rack or other supporting object. A forklift can also tip over without a load. When a forklift is in motion without a load, the center of gravity is near the rear of the vehicle and very close to the side of the stability triangle. At this point, any quick turn or even an unstable driving surface could cause the forklift to tip over. Another aspect of the stability triangle is the vertical stability or the line of action. This is a vertical line that runs through the forklift's center of gravity. If the line of action shifts outside the stability triangle, the forklift will tip over. Additional factors in keeping the line of action within the stability triangle include the placement of the load on the forks, how high the load is raised, the angle of the floor underneath the forklift, and momentum. In the event of a forklift tipping, do not jump free. You could be crushed beneath the forklift or the load. Brace yourself, hold on to the steering wheel and pull yourself tight up to it. Keep all parts of your body inside the operator's area. Before picking up a load, it should be inspected to make sure it is properly secured and won't shift during travel. You also need to make sure the load is within the weight limit for your forklift. When approaching a load, stop about 12 inches before reaching the load. Make sure your forks are adjusted as wide as possible for the load. Square up on its center and level the forks at the height appropriate for lifting the load. Drive slowly forward until the load rests against the mast. Lift the load high enough to clear the floor or rack and then tilt the mast back slightly to a traveling position. If necessary, lower the load to a few inches above the ground so as to clear all objects while traveling. If the load obstructs your view, drive in reverse or use a spotter to make sure your pathway is clear and safe. Before using a ramp, make sure it can support the load. Use only approved portable ramps or dock plates. Be sure they are securely in place before using them. When transporting a load on a slope, always keep the forks pointed uphill. When coming down a slope, always do so in reverse so as not to risk losing your load. Never drive across a slope at an angle with or without a load. This can cause the forklift to tip over. Some powered industrial trucks may not be driven on a slope. Please consult the operator's manual for more information. Before driving onto a rail car, truck, or trailer, set the vehicle's brakes. Next, block its wheels. Make sure trailers are supported under their kingpin with a fixed jack or the tractor truck. Finally, check the floor surface to make sure it will support the weight of the truck and your load. <laughs> If you are going to be away from the forklift at a distance of 25 feet, the vehicle needs to be shut off. Place the transmission in neutral or park, apply the parking brake, and lower the forks all the way to the ground. Be sure that you are not blocking any exit paths or firefighting equipment. If working in a rail yard, do not park closer than 8 feet from the railroad tracks. If parked on a slope, make sure to place blocks behind the wheels.
Before operating an electric powered truck, make sure the battery connections are on tight. Next, check the battery's electrolyte level. Be sure to use personal protective equipment such as eye protection, face shield, and gloves. The battery should be removed from the vehicle or the battery compartment needs to remain open while charging. When charging batteries, be sure to do so in designated no smoking areas. Charging batteries produces flammable hydrogen gas, so use care to avoid causing sparks or flames. You need to leave the charger off until you have connected it to the battery and again have it off when you disconnect it from the battery. When replacing a battery, make sure to secure it in place. A loose battery during operation can overturn a vehicle. The refueling of vehicles that run on propane, gasoline, or diesel fuels should only be done in designated no smoking areas and the engines must be turned off. For propane fueled trucks, remove the propane tanks prior to refilling. After refilling, make sure the tank location pin is properly aligned before securing the tank to the truck. All combustion fueled trucks should have an annual emissions test to monitor their emission levels. This is especially important for trucks operated indoors. Be sure the work area you are in is well ventilated to prohibit the buildup of carbon monoxide. Approved employee platforms may be used to elevate personnel. These platforms are the only method for lifting anyone standing or sitting on the forks. Other attachments may be used if they are approved and have a nameplate stating their capacity. It is important to remember that attachments will change the load center and diminish the capacity of the forklift. Always determine the correct capacity of your equipment before lifting any load. Operating forklifts and any powered industrial truck is an important job. Use the knowledge and skills presented in this video to operate forklifts in a professional and safe manner. All right, any questions about the video at all? Uh, we pretty much touched base on everything that they went through in the video. Um, so if you have any questions or whatever, I'll break down a couple scenarios probably. But um, Let's see here. All right, types and characteristics of forklifts. Um, powered industrial trucks are divided into seven classes. Uh, does anybody are familiar with all the classes, uh, different forklifts? Um, everything from solid tire, pneumatic tire, narrow aisle, um, and your, your construction type heavy duty stuff. Uh, we'll break all that down, tow tractors and such. Um, so power industrial trucks divided into seven classes. Class one, electric motor rider trucks. Um, those are, those are going to be anything like your crown sit downs out here, the electrics and octanes that we got sitting out here, stuff like that. Um, Always going to be, from what I've seen, a solid tire because they're always run indoors. No emissions. Class two electric motor narrow aisle trucks. Um, this could be anything from a sit down to pallet jack. Essentially, each pallet jack does have its own category, but your narrow aisle trucks are your reach, your order pickers, dockers, stuff like that. Um, turret trucks are even considered narrow aisle, which is pretty fascinating because they're so big. Uh, turret trucks, I'll break it down and I'll show them to you here in a minute. Okay, um, class three electric motor hand trucks or hand rider trucks. These are your pallet jacks. Uh, you can ride on some of them and you can also walk alongside some of them. Um, class four internal combustion engine trucks, solid cushion tires. So your IC, your propane, gasoline trucks out there uh, with a solid cushion tire. That's your class four. Class five is your internal combustion engine trucks, pneumatic tire. Um, so that could mean outdoor, tons of different category of use. Um, class uh, six, electric and internal combustion engine tractors. 
Uh, that varies. We'll break that down a little bit better in the in the PowerPoint. Uh, class seven rough terrain forklift trucks. A lot of your telehandlers, such like that telehandlers, perfect example of that classification. Uh, start with class one electric motor rider trucks. The weight of these trucks usually counterbalance the weight that is carried on the forks with the front axle as the fulcrum. This type of truck is often used indoors because it does not emit exhaust. And like they say here, um, did they, now, I mean, regardless, propane emits exhaust, without a doubt. I was going to say, why? Uh, yeah, I'm sitting here, I'm sitting here, I've never really caught that one before, but that's not true. So, moving on. Class 2, electric motor narrow aisle trucks. The weight of the load is often more spread out and does not use an axle as the fulcrum. But the battery is part of the counterweight. And I'm going to address this a great deal today because we all work in this facility and I'm finding batteries come in that are quite a bit smaller than rated capacity is. That relates directly to the safety of that operator. All of you included. Um, it is very important that we have the correct battery in each and every truck out there, whether it be in our facility or out at customers, which we are also sending them out. Um, these need to be the correct battery. They are part of the counterweight. <clears throat> Class 2 electric motor aero, uh, narrow aisle trucks. And get into looking at some of these uh, turret trucks. These are a big unit. You'll sit up inside this thing and and the forks will move 180 degrees from one side of the aisle to the other and also has a lift and a reach. Pretty impressive units. Look pretty big, still classified as a narrow aisle truck. The weight of the load is often more spread out and does not use an axle as a fulcrum. The operator must wear a harness for fall protection if the platform must be elevated with the forks such as the operator, the order picker, or turret trucks. Okay, um, reach type outrigger, um, you'll find these, these will have the outriggers, um, kind of part of the counter, counterweight, uh, not counterweight, but counterbalance. Okay, types of characteristics of forklifts again. Class three, electric motor hand or hand rider trucks. These trucks are used for transporting pallets. They generally do not lift the load very high off the ground, some can be ridden while others must be walked beside. A lot of varieties of these trucks too. Um, you've got walkie stackers as kind of a pallet jack. You guys are probably familiar with those now. Um, nonetheless, battery still being part of counterweight. And one thing you find in there when you're running too small a battery, people are jamming doggone steel bars in that and you, nobody is weighing these steel bars and nobody understands what weight's missing from the cells that are missing in the batteries that belong there. Um, so, and, and, and then half the time, I'm only just now recently starting to see the, the uh, extra steel being jammed in there. Uh, used to be just taking ram boards in there until the thing don't move no more. You know, and, and that is, is the most unsafe practice. It's like sticking your hands on a closing door, knowing it, you know? I mean, it's just absurd knowing we're putting that out there. Very unsafe. Um, regardless, the, that battery man, if it slides and it is loose in there, it gets jammed um, up against one side. I mean, it, the momentum of it alone and the weight and the force can, so just be super observant of that amongst ourselves at least. <laughs> Um, moving on. Class 4, internal combustion engine trucks, solid cushion tires. Class 4 trucks are used, uh, use a tank of combustible gas such as LPG to power the truck. Uh, the tires on the Class 4 trucks are solid rubber or are filled with foam to prevent punctures. Uh, these are great tires, great applications, smooth, durable, until you start hitting ruts and concretes, chunks of concrete missing, such things like that. Uh, once you rip a chunk of that, that solid cushion out, it just starts chunking. So keep an eye out for something like that. That's usually the biggest safety hazard with that particular application. 
Um, the wear on those attire would be worn down. Once you get down to the sizing, the lettering, or the numbers that are that indicate the size of the tire, that's a rule of thumb says that is a worn tire. It's its wear indicator, essentially, unless it has something otherwise specifically to indicate such. Um, in the in the industry, it's typically a rule of thumb. Um, types and characteristics of forklifts: Class Five internal combustion engine trucks, pneumatic tire. Class 5 trucks use a tank of combustible gas, such as LPG, to power the truck as well. The tires on the Class 5 trucks are reinforced and filled with air. Um, totally different feel to how it operates. Um, I use for an example, one particular customer had me out, said that his truck would not pick up the rated capacity. It was a 15,000 pound truck or something. He wasn't picking up, I don't think, even 8,000 pounds. And, and it was a big uh, support beam they used to, to pick up steel and, and relocate stuff. But when uh, I, I just couldn't understand, right? I got on it and I drove it and everything felt great. I asked him, show me what, where you feel you're losing that, that capacity when you're, as you're lifting. Let me watch you lift it. He went over and he picked that sucker up and he started picking it up just over free lift and it hit the second stage. What happened was the pneumatic tires, they bounced because they went into that other stage and the whole thing bounced and he stopped. The guy just caved, you know, he was just scared to go any further because of that movement. But he didn't understand the absorption of that, of that pneumatic tire. Perfectly capable of picking up the rated capacity. Um, he just wasn't familiar with the truck. So just, just notice totally different uh, feel once you jump on those pneumatic tires. And you do have to give it some extra, um, you know, careful uh, use without a doubt. Um, class six, um, electric and internal combustion engine tractors. And these tractors are commonly seen in salvage yards or to tow large planes. They are designed to push, pull, or carry very large loads. Um, these are not always uh, the only things considered tractors. You find um, there are little tow carts. So the, the, the baggage carts out at the airport are also considered tow tractors and stuff, such, things like that. So a large variety of actual tractors out there. Um, so just, you know, I mean, I don't know if you'll ever have to designate that particular class in anything that we do here. Um, okay, class seven, <laughs> rough terrain trucks. Okay, rough terrain trucks are very, very self-descriptive. Um, they are most useful in construction to lift and transport loads on the job site. Each has its advantages. There's a straight mast, um, which has more stability while transporting materials. And then there's an extended reach forklift telehandlers that can raise loads to elevated areas or across trenches. Outriggers um, play a huge factor in a lot of the counterbalance in this. And those are, uh, otherwise they're just set with a counterweight. Um, this one here is probably over a hundred foot long uh, telescope, and that's probably why the why the outriggers are even necessary. But you do see them out there without them. Okay, uh, pre-operation inspections. This one here is um, most critical. Probably not, and yeah, I'm going to say most critical for us here too, without a doubt, because once again. One of the biggest problems we've got, this is a big opportunity to have in all of us in here because um, when you go out to a customer, one of the biggest concerns uh, in the field is that, is that oh, things were overlooked. And I'm probably, we, I hear about it all the time because I've overlooked stuff out there. No, Rick is on us like stink on, you know, and, and, um, and so you hear that some of the most out there. Um, a lot of times when it's the customers in here mostly, um, it's beneficial to them to do this for the fact that uh, when they do an inspection on their truck, then they don't they, and they find something wrong with their truck, something that could use repair. Uh, it's, just, it's preventative at this point, or it's truly a, a immediate safety concern. They can they can take it to their supervisor or maintenance, whoever does the checkoffs on them, and say, "This is what I've identified. Should I run this truck or shouldn't I?" At that point, they're telling you, we are telling them that you can drive that truck until I get the repair done, you're perfectly safe, sign off on of it, that driver is safe. Here, it's just good for us to get them out there done right so that they are not, I mean, we're doing the same exact inspections. In fact, ours are 
a great deal more in depth uh, than what the customers are doing. And um, it just, it, so we have a way better opportunity to never hear any of these complaints. Um, it's good for the company, it's good for the customer, and it's good for our own general practice of safety. Um, so this is something I think should be addressed a great deal more in depth um, for us and for the customer. <clears throat> okay, so um, these ones here, uh, we'll actually go out and physically do this, so we'll go through this on, on paper first. Um, inspections should be performed at the beginning of each shift. Any time a new operator gets on the truck, there should be an inspection done. Follow an inspection checklist that is provided by the employer. The list should contain at least lights, horn, brakes, backup alarms, seat belts, mast, chains, carriage, tires, fluid level, steering, overhead guards, backrest. Always inspect the items that do not require the engine to be running first, then check all other components. Check the forklift by maneuvering it through normal positions and ensure that it does not hesitate or delay. We'll do that more thorough when we go out into the shop. Okay, uh, let's see here today. How did that change over to that one? Okay. Basic driving safety. Um, we all know how to drive a truck in here. Um, have you driven before? What's your name? I'm sorry. Kyle. Kyle, I'm Tony. Uh, all right. Um, are you driving an IC truck or electric? Electric. Electric? Okay, great. All right. Um, seat belts must be worn on at all times while driving a powered industrial truck. Keep all body parts in the operator's cabin at all times. Safety belt is most critical, um, I believe, 100%. Um, I use the example of tipping over. And, you know, the way that, uh, the only other thing protecting you is grabbing hold of the steering column, getting your hands up underneath the steering column, locking yourself to that sucker. And if you go down in any manner, you're locked onto that. You don't want your hips trying to slide out on you. I mean, if you've got those two points of secure, that, that are secure, then, then you're going to stay in that truck while it finishes doing whatever it's, it's doing, keeping yourself safe. No sense in reaching out. I mean, you're just going to lose limbs. There's nothing you can do to stop it. A truck just rolling at one mile an hour between you and the wall is going to crush you. It's not, you're not going to stop it. They're just too heavy. They're just too heavy. And, and uh, one of my, you know, I really wanted to be able to set up a driving example um, because the example I like to use is, is a puddle of oil on the floor. And it changes how you feel everything. Um, when you slide, when you go to hit your brakes, you expect to stop. Now these trucks, you do. No different than your car. They're designed to stop all that weight without you necessarily, necessarily noticing the amount of weight that you're stopping until you hit some oil and you slip and you feel all of a sudden your whole body just senses and feels that amount of weight that you're packing on your back. And um, it really changes. You know what kind of impact you're going to have when you feel that weight tagging along with you. So yeah, that would be a great example. I'd want to set something up like that just to let everybody feel that slide in that because it does. It changes how you feel. Uh, just to just be observant of that massive amount of weight that is in there. And I do mean if that thing is just rolling and you're standing behind it, you're not going to stop it. They're just, they're just too, too heavy. <clears throat> um, only operate trucks in de designated safe areas. Make sure the surface is clean and free of spills or debris. Um, Debris is no better. It can cause just as present, just as uh, hazardous a situation for you. Be alert to the surroundings. Watch for obstructions, low-hanging items, lights, sprinkler heads, or pedestrians. It's always a big factor. Sprinkler heads. Um, in here, we're not going to run into a great deal of it. Maybe some of our ventilation or our heaters, stuff like that that's hanging out there. Um, always just a good to be observant of it. Um, never go too fast. Forklift should never be driven faster than allows for a safe stopping distance. Um, what I've learned and know on the electrics are um, your electric truck, when you release the pedal, you should stop within the distance of the truck. That's no more than four feet. Um, on these trucks here, 
If you jump on one, I just took it out for a test example, hit the brake, essentially it's the same stopping distance, the length of the truck. So a safe stopping distance is the length of the truck. After that, you know, you're probably not necessarily unsafe, whether it be that it's just adjusted wrong or, you know, you don't have, um, you know, as much brake pressure, whatever. There's so many different factors, but regardless, within a truck length or two, you want a safe stopping distance, comfortable stopping distance. And if it does not stop in, a, in a, what feels as a safe distance, then just let somebody know. Look at these brakes, you know. Um, you know, once again, for sure, it, that uh, you don't want to mess around with that. Um, never go too fast. So slow down and sound horn at all intersections. Huge. Um, he's not in here right now. I wish he was. I'm surprised he's not in here. The other, the other old boy out there at the end of the wall. Uh, what's his name? The new mechanic? Huh? Josh. 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 Is that his name? Yeah, I don't think he's here. Oh, man. <laughs> he should have been in his class. Um, that was one of those packets. So, we had another gentleman driving. I'm going to use this example um, because I was standing there watching the whole thing. And oh, yeah. horn is super critical. I, I tell everybody, use your horn, use your horn, use your horn. Who cares who it annoys? It, that, it's not about, it's about safety, and it's a rule. Who cares if that horn annoys somebody? That's its purpose. Um, when you're driving around a corner, a blind corner to boot, like that boy out over there, he had his forks in the air, he had his mask tilted forward on some wood blocks with it jacked in the air so he could work on it. And he's standing there working on it safely without having to worry about any danger around him. That kid learned what the weight of one of these trucks is that day when another guy come running across there backwards and knocked his blocks out from underneath his mast without even anybody knowing he was there. And it can, and the whole entire truck just bam, right into the guy, and off he, he's over here hopping around like doggone, somebody just took shots at him. You know, very, very <coughs> uncool. Um, his forks were actually yeah. up in, his forks were in the air. His forks the were in the other dude's forks were in the air too. So uh, it was top of the LBR hit his forks. It, it took it completely it off of the freaking mouse. Yeah, and the dude was like, he was, kneeling, he was kneeling down like over the forklift and it like came and hit his leg. Like the whole thing shifted. This over wasn't talked about. Like so leg. I insist we talk about it today because that kid could have gotten hurt badly. And, um, and, I, and I'm not okay that that, that wasn't observed. Um, it's very critical that incidences like that are observed because they don't change if they're not observed. And, and if we deny them, we overlook them, people get hurt. And I've seen it, and I don't want to see it anymore. So anything I could do to see that stop, I will support it 100%. Um, it just it plowed right into the kid, and, and before you know it, he's saying, I'm fine, everything's okay. Everybody washed it under the rug, but it's not a washed under the rug situation. It happened, and the, the kid felt it hurt because of it. <laughs> anyway, um, that he says, and he came up to me later, and he says, dude, he says, I didn't know, understand what the weight of that machine was, and that's what affects you. I didn't say anything to him. He, the, the weight of that machine, once it was coming at me, you, it impacts you. You know exactly what that thing's capable of once you're in danger of it. There's no doubt. It tells you right now. So that's why I think it's really important to do some sort of a little driving uh, safety, you know, example. Or you could just feel that because that one I know does it every time. <laughs> it lets you know right quick. But anyway, so, uh, Jesus, I mean, Christmas, use your horn. And overheads and surroundings and things like that, use your horn. Um, just to let people know that you're there. We all like to drive, you know, even I, I, these things don't go that fast. Top speed is within safe operating distance or safe operating, you know, um, depending on, on where you're at. And you should be able to discretionarily be able to choose what that speed should be. Otherwise, it just, um, that horn lets everybody know you're coming. Hey man, okay, clear. Go on by, you know, right? And then, and, uh, and everybody's safe and happy and so on and so forth. Um, Nothing justifies not using that horn or that seatbelt. It's just those are so, so, such huge factors. Um, moving on, let's see here. Slow down and sound horn at all intersections. Never follow another truck closer than three truck lengths. Um, that's a good safe stopping distance without a doubt. Never allow riders anywhere on the vehicle. It happens all the time. Everybody's chuckling about one thing or another. 
everything's lighthearted until an accident happens. And these accidents happened, happen faster than, than most. Um, you know, in the blink of an eye, so, you know, you, don't, you can see a situation, but if you don't do something about it, it is a safety hazard and it very likely is on the, on the chop block for, for it becoming a happening. Um, you just want to be very, very careful and uh, everything you can do to be safe around these trucks, use that. There's never a stupid question, never anything you're going to do that's too safe. It, just do what protects you and people around you. Because, I mean, even if you didn't like somebody, if they were to be hurt, you wouldn't feel good about that. And that's like terribly something you have to live with for the rest of your life. So try to identify how you can better yourself safety, uh, your safety orientation. If if you if you feel like you're in the right workplace, you know what I mean. <clears throat> um, never follow another truck closer than three lengths. Never allow riders anywhere on the vehicle. Always travel with the load as close as safely possible to the ground. Um, OSHA thinks uh, that I know they're. Um, they say six inches is, is close enough to the ground. Four inches is plenty high enough off the ground um, to run. Um, your loads, you're not going to catch anything. There's never going to be anything four inches off the ground. They really, and if there is, it needs to be really moved out of the way. You know, you know so um, always cross tracks or other bumps in the path at an angle to maintain two wheels on the ground at all times. Um, and then another one, always make sure that your forks are pointed uphill. If your forks are always pointed uphill, guarantee your, your uh, it's a good rule of thumb. <clears throat> Okay, stability. The stability triangle, figure one, that when the vehicle is loaded, the combined center of gravity shifts toward line BC. Um, okay, here, let me reword that. When the vehicle is loaded, the combined center of gravity shifts towards it, line B and C. That's correct. You never want, uh, I'm just going to read this through because it pretty well specifies what, what you should look for. Uh, theoretically, the maximum load will result in the center of gravity at the line BC. In actual practice, the combined center of gravity should never be at line BC. That's at maximum load capacity. The addition of additional counterweight will cause the truck counter gra gravity, center of gravity to shift toward point A and result in a truck that is less stable laterally. Once you have once you have that uh, center of gravity closer to your A here, you're less stable laterally because that's, that comes into a triangle. Your fulcrum comes into a triangle here. The, um, all right, let's move to the next one. So this one should really be after the next slide, so we'll come back to it. Um, each load has its own load center. This is the distance from the mast to the center of the load's weight mast. They use 42 inches as a standard here. Um, it's just a, it's a typical pallet size, typical load dimension. Um, 42 inches, or 24 inches is your load center. 48 inches is your standard fork length. So they're going to use that in reference all along. Um, let's see here. This distance greatly affects the load capacity of the forklifts. Uh, nameplate. Oh, wait, I'm not losing here. Maybe I can read it from there. Uh, yeah, this distance greatly affects the load capacity of forklifts. The nameplate will state the load center measurement upon which this capacity is based. In most cases, this is 24 inches. That means that the load center should be no further than 24 inches away from the mass of the forklift. If the load center is further away, then the load capacity will diminish. Tilting the mass forward also changes the stability triangle. So just tilting your load out further um, just leans for, for forward uh, more load. Okay, um, the load center is see, then the, um, the mass should never be tilted forward, right, unless it is over a rack or other supporting object. Even then, you'll only Tilt slightly past level just to bring it and set it down. That's all your forks require anyway. Um, number one, forklifts can also tip over without a load. When forklifts are moving without a load, the center of gravity is near the rear of the vehicle and very close to the side of the stability triangle. At this point, any quick turn or even unstable driving surface should cause the forklift to tip over. Another aspect of the stability triangle is the vertical stability or the line of action. 
This is a vertical line of action that runs through the forklift center of gravity. If the line of action shifts outside the stability triangle, the forklift will tip over. The placement of the load on the forks, how high the load is raised, the angle of the floor underneath the forklift and momentum are all factors in keeping the line of action within the stability triangle. If your forklift begins to tip, do not jump. You can be crushed beneath the forklift or load. Brace yourself, hold onto the steering wheel and pull yourself tight up to it. Keep all parts of your body inside the operator area between that and your safety belt. You should not come out of that compartment. You should be plenty safe. Okay, next slide. All right, transporting loads, inspecting loads to ensure that they are properly secure, won't shift during travel, and that the load is not too heavy for the lift. When approaching, um, well, we haven't quite got to it yet. When approaching the load, adjust forks as wide as possible and position them at the correct level before picking up the load. Drive forward until the load rests against the, the mast and level the forks. Lift the load high enough to clear the, fork, you know, the floor or rack and then tilt the mast slightly back. Once clear from obstruction, lower the mast to a few inches off the ground to clear any obstacles while traveling. If the load is too tall and obstructs your view, try backwards or have a spotter. Excuse me. That's another big issue is, is uh, the, the masts are getting more and more complex. And there's more technology going into them, and they start taking all your view. So you, before long, we're just going to be driving forklifts backwards all the time just because of the stuff that they insist on putting into the mass. So, but with a load on it, um, pretty well drive backwards all the time. I do. Um, there's, they've, they've got a very convenient now. They've got a great deal of, uh, they've got a great deal of, uh, features at the overhead guard where a handle, a horn, and everything right there. So if you're comfortable enough to keep your hands inside the overhead guard, which you should never reach out. So everything you need is right there. Um, let's see here. So I'm going to spot our next slide. Always inspect the surfaces on ramps. Surfaces. Uh, uh, um, inspect the surfaces the lift will be traveling on. Make sure that any ramps or trailer floor surfaces can support the weight. Never drive across a slope at an angle because the lift could tip over. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, before entering a trailer, rail car, or truck, make sure the brakes are set on the trailer, the wheels are blocked, and are properly supported so that they don't tip over while you're driving in them. Down here, I don't know. I didn't even really think about it till today. Um, out there in the field, you've got a lot of different uh, options for you. You've got red and green lights at each dock now. Um, if you're going into a trailer, that light should be green. And if you're a truck driver sitting out there, you should see red, means he shouldn't pull away, um, and vice versa when they're ready to release. But there should always be uh, wheel chocks under the, the wheels, in front of the wheels. Um, well, I believe the facility is supposed to provide them. They should be out there at the dock on the ground. All those docks out there should have at least one wheel chalk. <coughs> and every time a truck pulls up there, that chalk, those trucks should be chalked. You guys shouldn't be driving in and out of these trucks without wheel chalks on those trucks. Um, something just to keep in mind. And um, and that goes, it's the same everywhere. A lot of times those guys come over, drop their trailer, I've seen it here, leave the dollies down and take off. There's nothing, we don't have a, we don't have a, uh, a dolly for the for the fifth wheel pin, so um, that truck should essentially never be driven into and out of. Just keep that in mind. Nothing, most importantly, nothing you guys choose not to do due to a safety factor cannot it cannot get you fired. There's nothing you could say if if you if you believe it's a safety hazard and you choose not to do it, you cannot be fired for that until it is brought to what you know is the, the safety policy for whatever you're required to handle. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> Always approach ramps with the load facing uphill. If the load is facing downward, there is a good chance that it will be lost. Parking, um, if the operator leaves the vehicle out of sight or is farther than 25 feet, the lift should be off. Um, 
you know, use your own discretion again. I like to point out there's a lot of people running around. Some people are silly, silly, ha ha. Uh, I want to kick the doggone thing into drive or reverse or whatever, you know. Can't guarantee that our parking brakes, maybe from your inspection, you know your parking brake has got plenty of, of a hold or whatever. Um, for, so that if somebody did kick it into drive, it's not just going to take off rolling. A lot of trucks out there also don't allow you to do that. But a lot of what we work around here do. Um, it could be sitting there running and somebody, you could be over here doing whatever. It could be a total accident. Somebody just walked by and something sticking out of their arm, swing around and clip the shift lever. It's up to you if you want to leave that truck. OSHA says you're okay to do it for up to 25 feet. You can leave it running. Or with inside of it. <coughs> um, place transmission in neutral. Apply the parking brake. Lower the forks to the ground. I always say tip them just a little bit to get the tips pointed down. And I'll show you as an example out there. Um, but they always just do say lower the forks. Out here, there's a great deal of times that we can't have our forks on the ground. Throw some rags over it, a cone, something like that. Tape off the area or whatever. Um, I, I started doing that after walking into them so many times, you know. And I'm leaving them up just the same. And I'm no different than anybody else. I've done all of these things. And in fact, I, I, I'd like to teach it because I like to keep it fresh in my mind. You know, I'd like to make sure when somebody comes walking in, my equipment is the last thing they're worried about. <clears throat> um, do not block paths or firefighting equipment. Uh, electrical cabinets, um, fire hoses, things like that, 36 inches from them. Don't park any within 36 inches. Block wheels if on a slope. Uh, fuel and batteries. Make sure battery connections are tight before operating. Um, test the battery's electrolyte level. Remember to use personal protective equipment. Uh, this being the standard for most shows, an apron, face shield, and rubber gloves. Um, testing your battery's electrolyte level is something we may do, us. Um, not the operator, but um, uh, you may well check the electrolyte level. You're going to want to have rubber gloves on when you do. Um, the requirements are, like I say, face shield, uh, rubber, rubber gloves, and an apron. And there should be, uh, we'll move on here real quick, battery charging should only be done in designated no smoking areas. Charging procedures uh, produces flammable hydrogen gas. Don't turn the charger on until the battery is connected. Make sure the battery is, is secured in a compartment. Batteries that move may cause the lift to turn over. They didn't have said anything in here yet. Well ventilated areas, they did. Um, that hydrogen gas all by itself, if you take one breath of it, you're not going to want to take two. And it happens way more often than you'd like. Um, especially I had Budweiser was one of my accounts up there. Um, I've had large, large customers with great deal of battery supply and, and, and uh, storage. And multiple ventilation systems out the walls, but it constantly smelled like hydrogen gas over there. And it was always being ventilated. They are required. But if you if you breathe it in one time, it burns. It just it just closes your throat down. Um, you know, there's all kinds of the the explosive uh, nature of the gas. Um, I used to burn the lead cell battery interconnecting cells in um, bars on the on the cells, and I didn't. We used to take a pop all the caps on the battery, blow all the gas out of it, and then we can go to work with our flame. Um, I went over one time, went right to work, and blew the cell right off to the ceiling. I mean, boom. Just blew it right off there, scared the Jesus out of me. And uh, so I highly recommend be observant that they're very explosive, poisonous gases. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. Fuel and batteries, combustion fuel trucks, check the emissions annually on all combustible fuel trucks, only refuel in designated no smoking areas. Uh, remove propane tanks prior to refilling again. They say apron, face shield, and some rubber gloves. Um, remove propane tanks prior to refilling. When replacing the tank, ensure the tank location pin is aligned before securing the tank. We'll never deal with filling our own tanks. Did we just run out? Something beeped over here. Yep. Great. Um, attachments. 
Another very serious problem in the industry are attachments. Uh, some forklifts can use platforms to raise and lower personnel. These platforms are the only approved method for raising anyone standing or sitting on the, fork, on the forks. Fall protection devices must be used. Um, they don't really touch base on it here. You've seen the guy in the basket. He did not have fall protection on. Never at any time should you take your feet over four feet off the ground without fall protection on in any circumstance. Um, I think a ladder is you can go up and hook yourself up at the top, but uh, anytime you're inside a basket, the chini lifts, the telehandlers, anything that might put you above four feet off the ground, your feet over four feet off the ground requires a harness, fall protection. Um, there are many other attachments that can be used. Each attachment must have a plate stating the weight capacity. Remember that these attachments can change the load center of gravity and then diminish the load capacity. So. Every single time, this is a carpet stinger here added onto a very small forklift, probably a 3,000 pound forklift there. And, and they're these stingers, they're, they're, you know, 24 foot, you know, pieces of carpet sometime. Their, their weight diminishes significantly. So when attachment like this is, is added to a truck, there should be the factory from Toys. That looks like a little Toyota. Toyota would provide a, uh, a data tag specific to that attachment. So now you can calculate what the added weight is that you can, that you can, that you're going to be carrying around and deduct that from the original data tag. You have to be able to do that. It's simple to do and I'll show you the tag on the, the data tag out there. Um, one of the first things you should look at when you get on truck is that data tag. It's on the inspection form. Make sure it's clear and legible. Um, Make sure that you know what the capacity of that truck is when you get on it. Go over and pick something up, and it doesn't it doesn't have the battery kind of weight on there to have, you know, and you didn't do this number. All those data tags out there on the trucks with the small batteries in it mean nothing, absolutely nothing. <clears throat> okay, in conclusion, operators must complete a training course before operating any powered industrial truck. Always wear a seatbelt while operating a powered industrial truck. Approach tracks or any bumps in the road at an angle to maintain at least two wheels on the ground. Turn off trucks anytime that you are more than 25 feet away or out of sight of the truck. Attachments can change the center of gravity and cause a truck to tip over more easily.